So when we involve ourselves in politics, it's not about power. As Chris said earlier, it's not even really about the United States of America. It's not about... It's not about America. It's about God and our stewardship of the authority that he's given to us. And if we steward it well, we will be blessed. But it's about God, not about the United States of America. And it's not about power. And I assure you, that thought has gotten lost in the politics with which I'm familiar. But you know, it's because it is God's power that in Romans chapter 13... Paul refers to the ruler, the magistrate, as the minister, the diakonos of God. That really struck me when I read it. That word diakonos is the same word used of the apostle Paul, a minister to the Gentiles. It's the word used of Christ who was the diakonos of a new covenant. It's the word we use for our deacons. It is a sacred calling because we are holding and exercising a power that is not our own but is God. And all we do is administer it. It's the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar had to learn that I wish we could learn. You may recall Nebuchadnezzar stood on the roof of his house and said, Look what I have done by my great power, by the might of my great power, and for the glory of my majesty. And I love what it says. While the word was still in his mouth, God said, Sovereignty, power has been removed from you. In essence, he was saying, you know, he lost his mind. God was already saying, man, you're out of your mind. It is my power you hold, and you hold it for my glory, not yours, because my glory I will not give to another, as the psalmist says. And if you think it's about you, you're wrong. Now that you've lost your mind, everybody else is going to know it because you're going to wander around in the field like a cattle. And when you come to your senses, then I'll restore your kingdom. And it's interesting, it said he went down eating the grass, looking down. But when he recognized God's sovereignty, it said he looked up. It's not about power, see, it's about stewardship. In fact, all of life is about stewardship because we don't have anything. We don't have the breath in our own nostrils. Which of you thinking he can add one cubit to his life? Silly man. It's all about stewardship, and we need to steward that authority, and our elected officials need to understand that they are called to a place of stewardship. But you know what else then struck me? I was reading not too long after that and saw the phrase, the power of the ballot box. And as much as we want to rag on our elected officials sometime because they abuse their power, How well do we steward the power we have as voters? See, your power doesn't really come from the Constitution. It comes ultimately from God. And just like he calls you to steward your money and your time and your talents, he calls you to steward the authority he gives you. It's true, whether it's in the home, as the husband having authority over the wife, steward it. Well, because it's God's. The money, it's God's. The power you hold as citizens, it's God's. And I began to think of this, the steward, the servant, who was given a talent and who buried it and didn't use it and didn't exercise it and God took it away from him and cast him out. And how many Christians I've run into that said, well, it's not, all my, it's not my fault. I don't even vote. You see the dualism there? We've created some world over here called secular, and we're not going to dirty our hands in that. No, I'm living over in this spiritual kingdom. And you've been taken captive by law. Paul says in Colossians 2, verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by empty traditions and philosophies of men. And my friends, I'm afraid too many in the church have been taken captive by the philosophies of partisan politics, of a lust for power, 
have been taken captive by the philosophies of political philosophers like John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and all those others. And we've been taken captive. We don't realize that we are called to engage as stewards of what God's given us. And if we're not registered to vote, let me be honest, I think it is sinful. It is the servant who took the talent and buried it and didn't use it. If you're not registered to vote, I hope you'll call my office. You'll call the church office and say, how do I get registered to vote? God's given me something and I've not been using it and I need to use it. Or maybe, maybe you've got it, but you don't really cast an informed vote. You just vote for the person because they're of your party. Or you vote for the person because they have your color of skin. Or they vote for the person because, you know, they're a part of your profession. Or you vote for the person because you think they're going to help build a strong economy. My friends, if I read scripture right, it says that it is righteousness that exalts a nation. And God says to seek ye first my kingdom and the things will be added unto you. And we're worried about the things and not the righteousness. So often in the church. And about a month ago, I was reading in the book of Amos chapter 5. I'm running out of time. I'm out of time. Oh my goodness. Feel free to get up and leave for those who want to hear the end. In verse 21, he says, I hate, I reject your festivals. I don't delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer burnt offerings, I will not accept them. I won't look on them. Take away the noise of your song. Choir, just go ahead and leave. I don't want to listen to the sounds of your harp. Orchestra, go home. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-living stream. See, if what we do in here doesn't make any difference out there, then it doesn't make any difference to God either. We must be engaged. I'm out of time. Wow. I'm really sorry. But I want to to close with something that has struck me profoundly in in just really the last month. As you can tell, God's been striking me profoundly quite a bit for a while. And I guess he has to strike me profoundly because I'm thick-headed at times. But as we think here about the supremacy of God in all things and our stewardship of all things, I'm reminded of the story of the rich young ruler who lived in this kingdom of stuff and he came to Jesus because he wanted to get a little of this kingdom of God eternal life stuff too. And Jesus said to him, no, you can't live in two kingdoms at the same time. You can live in the kingdom of stuff or you can live in my kingdom. You decide which one is really real. But you can't live in both. And and, and you know that really struck me because I realize many times I'm trying to live in two different kingdoms at the same time. And Jesus says you can't do it. You see there's a false kingdom out there. It's the kingdom of man, not the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of man is illusory and false. It's not true. In that kingdom, oh yes, you can go to church. If you want to, go to church. If you want to give some money, yeah, give some money. If you, if you want to do things, you know, go to the picnic tonight, yeah, go do that. Go do that. That's okay. If you want to do that, do that. You can see, because in the kingdom of man, Satan is happy for you to do what you want to do if you want to do it. But in the real kingdom, God is king. And he calls us to obedience and to allegiance to him. And you know what I'm beginning to understand? Is that that's real life. That's where the real stuff is. That's what gives life meaning. It keeps life from being illusory and unreal. So, we close. If you don't know Jesus Christ, then you're living in a fantasy land that's not really real. It's not the kingdom that will endure. It's not the kingdom that will produce an eternal happiness. Because God says, in my presence is fullness of joy. And in my right hand are pleasures evermore. Not fast cars, fast women, and money and stuff. And maybe you do know this Jesus 
But maybe you, like I, need to begin asking yourself every day the haunting question, do I really believe what I believe is really real? Am I living like what I believe is really real? Or am I just kidding myself? I really don't want to haunt you as I've been haunted, but it's been a good thing. Ask yourself in every situation, in every moment, in every crisis, what am I believing? And am I believing a lie? What's really real?